Um, thank you for coming everyone. My name is Katherine Galvan and I will be talking about double ethnic identity. So in my research, I wanted to look at the amount of assimilation that Hispanic college students are faced with in the United States. And I was defining assimilation as incorporating aspects that are seen as part of the Anglo-American culture. And with that being said, there's a misconception to what exactly um, it means to assimilate. Uh, there's common sense that is uh, if one is assimilated, then they are part of that culture and they fit in with that culture, whereas if someone is not assimilated, then they don't fit into that culture. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that, especially when dealing with individuals who are, um, who are living in the United States but have origins of a different country, making them bicultural. And I started looking at this issue in high school. I went to Forest Grove High School where the majority, or where the where at the time, 30% of the population was of Hispanic descent, and a majority of those were Mexicans. And however, I was Peruvian, or my parents were of Peruvian descent, and I felt like I didn't quite fit in, and it wasn't because, uh, it wasn't, I didn't felt like I didn't quite fit in with the Hispanic population, and it wasn't because of me being Peruvian, I felt like it had to do more with the fact that I was more involved with school things and extracurriculars that were seen as more of an Anglo-American thing. In order to do my research, I did a qualitative, qualitative interviews. I asked 21 questions that were designed to measure the amount of assimilation in regards to language, culture, and discrimination. I, my sample consisted of individuals who were of Mexican descent. They were from second generation and generation 1.5. Second generation is people whose parents immigrated from Mexico but they were born here, whereas generation 1.5 are students who were born in Mexico but they came here at such an early age that they basically grew up here in the United States. I sent an email to my friends asking if they would be interested in this research and I got six replies back saying that they would follow up an interview with me and I got the remaining four through the snowball effect, which is basically just getting, getting um, more people from people that you already know and that meet these requirements. So I asked them if they would be interested in participating. And I ended up with a disproportionate sample of five males and five females. And they were around, the, they were, they were predominantly around the ages of 21. And so it's important to note that because not everyone from Forest Grove High School who graduated and is currently in college had a chance to participate in my interview, my sample is only measuring the amount of assimilation towards the sample that I did obtain. And like I said before, I asked them questions that were supposed to measure the amount of language, culture, and discrimination towards the dominant culture, as well as asked a few questions in regards to this, uh, and toward in their ethnic identity and how they view themselves. English language acquisition is part of being educated in the United States and is a crucial part of the acculturation process. And this was evident when I asked my sample of second generation. Five out, of seven of them, five out of seven of them stated that they learned English in preschool or kindergarten. And this is where a majority, the majority of them actually learned that there were other languages. I started learning English in kindergarten. That is when I first realized that there were other languages. Like seriously, I had no idea. And this is obvious because at the age of six or younger, a student is spending most of their time with their parents and their parents, as well as family members and intermediate family members, who are talking in their native language, which in this case is Spanish. Speaking. Introducing second language to children before the age of six or seven is an important factor in their ability to achieve fluency. This was also evident when I asked my sample in which language they felt that they spoke better in. Seven out of ten of them said that they spoke better in English. One of them stated that their ability to speak in English and Spanish was about the same. And two of them said that they felt that they spoke better in Spanish. 
My sample also demonstrated a high ability to write in English. Nine of them said that they wrote better in English, whereas one of them said that they weren't sure. And the fact that this individual wasn't sure demonstrates that his ability to write in English is either at the same or has surpassed his ability to write in Spanish. As far as thinking goes, seven of my sample believe they thought, or seven of my samples stated that they think in English. And um, one individual describes it as, I thought in Spanish when I was little. I remember that because when I was 10 or 11, I was sitting there thinking about something, and then I was like, whoa, I used to think in Spanish, and now I think in English. That's weird. It's weird when you actually sit there. It's like, holy crap, I don't think in the same language anymore. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and these are pretty much the same responses that I got from my sample. They acknowledged that at one point they couldn't possibly have thought in English because they didn't know English, but they don't exactly remember when that transition occurred. For those that, I had three that stated that they do think in both languages, and it really depends on the situation in, um, in their environment. It depends on who I'm with. If I'm with someone who speaks in English or an environment like in school or at work where I'm just speaking English, I think in English, but when I'm with my with a family member or at home, where everything is where everything is in Spanish, then I am thinking in Spanish. So, because uh, although these individuals have the capability to think in Spanish, because we are living in the United States, where the main language is English, and we see this in mass communications and higher education, this means that even though they have the, cap the ability to think in English, they are probably spent or in Spanish, they are probably spending most of their time thinking in English. Um, therefore, my sample, when it comes to language acquisition, are more assimilated towards the Anglo-American culture. Culture, when I asked my sample what they felt made someone Latino or Latina, they stated, seven of them stated culture, and I thought this was fascinating because I was already gonna ask them questions in regards to culture, but the fact that they, uh, on their own, told me this, signifies that it's something important to them that defines what a Latino or, or who a Latino or Latina is, what makes that up. And I asked them if they attended cultural events. However, I didn't define what a cultural event was. Six of them claimed that they didn't go to cultural events because they didn't, they didn't like to, they didn't have friends there, they didn't have time, or they simply just didn't hear about them. However, also with that said, they also mentioned things like I don't go to I don't go to cultural events unless you count Hispanic parties. Then yeah, I go to those. And so I was thinking about it, and I felt like um, Hispanic parties should be considered a cultural event because it's a lot different than going to an Anglo American party. And I have a quote that describes a little bit about this. In many cases, the parties in the backyard are in front of the stoop of our block. There's usually multi-generations and involve music and dancing. The family, from los viejitos to los niños, the children, are all part of the celebration. The parties usually go late into the early morning hours. The older generations will take the children off to bed, and the others will drink, dance, and party into the night. So, as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference there. And of the people who do claim that they attend cultural events, they mention that they were part of organizations and club, clubs and the help the community, the help the Hispanic community. And when I asked them what motivates them to be in these, to, to participate in these things, they stated that it was a way to go back to the roots and remember where they came from. In the Hispanic community, there's a tight knit between family and there's a large focus on sticking together. And I have this quote from this individual who puts it nicely. He states, family is family. I was raised to believe that family sticks together. My dad always says, unidos todo es posible. United, everything is possible. Yeah, and it's true. Something I kind of realized is the more family is united, the more they get accomplished. I guess because I've seen some families, some of my friends, their family isn't as united, and they will have problems. So going along with sticking together, I noticed that a majority of my sample lived off campus. And when I asked them why this was the case, they stated because of distance and family bond. And I have a student who describes his opinion on the American family versus the Hispanic family. An example would be like your average American, after they get out of high school, they try to go to college as far as they can. They try to separate themselves from their family, or when they're out of high school, usually their parents try to pick them out so they can live by themselves 
I still live with my parents. I don't know if you do. Almost all my Latino friends, they still live with their families. Not because they have to, it's because some of them actually want to. When I asked my sample whether they felt it was um, a priority to take care of elderly people, specifically parents, eight of them immediately said yes. And they stated reasons because they're going to college because of them and it was a way to give back to them. Whereas two of them didn't exactly say no, but they said, they um, implied that their parents were more independent, like they already had a house or they're already grown up. A few of them mentioned senior, center, senior centers and three of them stated that it could not be an option, whereas one of them didn't think that their parents would want to go there. So when it comes to culture, uh, my sample is more assimilated towards the Hispanic culture because they still have those values and morals of a Hispanic individual. As far as having their family of their own, when I asked my sample whether or not they would teach their child Spanish, their future child, nine of them stated that they would, and one of them said that they weren't sure. And the fact that this individual was unsure demonstrates that he, or he stated that he wasn't unsure because he doesn't know who his future significant other is going to be. So if it's someone who doesn't know Spanish, it's probably going to make it harder for them to both be able to teach their child Spanish. As far as how their own family would differ from the one that they have now, they all mentioned reasons as to being more assimilated. And the ones, the reasons that were repeated more than once, more than once for there would be more English in school, or they would encourage their students to be more involved in school, such as extracurriculars and sports. Discrimination. Racism, racism exists whenever it is claimed that a given social status is explained by a given natural characteristic. In other, words, in other words, racism occurs when there's one race that believes that they're more superior to another race. When I asked my sample, what do they think um, make, what do they think society thinks makes someone Latino or Latina? They mentioned things about skin color, negative stereotypes, and languages. And as you can see, this is a completely different response to how they view themselves. And I have a quote here that summarizes pretty much all of uh, the responses that I've got. If you're brown, if you work in the field, you have a shitty car, you only speak Spanish, and you don't know that much English. For the Latinas, you're probably going to get pregnant before you graduate high school. The males are probably going into gangs, and they're not going to graduate. They're going to drop out. You're not going into higher education. PCC or community college is probably where you're going to end up, and not even graduate from there. So as you can see, they have this view of how society views them versus how they view themselves. Therefore, I asked them whether or not they act different depending on the race that's around them. And six of them mentioned that they do. They describe this experience almost as having two different types of personas. Uh, one individual says, oh yeah, definitely. Like if I'm with my friends, I'll just be talking normal, or I guess what is considered normal here, you know, just talking English or whatever. And then when I'm with my Mexican friends, you will just be talking in English, but then I will throw in an orale and CCC, todo eso, all of that, you know. I'll just start throwing Spanish words in there, and I will turn up the Mexican music when it comes on the radio. <laughs> So for those of you, or to talk a little bit more about roles, for those of you that don't know, um, everyone has a role. One can be a mother, a sister, a friend. But when you're Hispanic, you have, or Hispanic living in America, you have the role of being Hispanic in America, and American. And oftentimes this creates conflict with each other, which leads to the ethnic identity crisis. When I asked my sample whether or not they've ever had a, they ever, just ever felt a form of Identity crisis, eight out of nine of them stated that they did. And notice how there's nine of them. Instead of 10, this is because I actually forgot to ask one of my interviewees during the process. And it says, um, when I go to Mexico, they think of me as a Mexicano, güero, or bingo. Even though I'm so brown, then when I'm with my white friends, they just look at my skin and think Mexican. In the beginning, it kind of hurts, I guess, because you're not American in the eyes of America. You're not American, you're a Mexican. But when you're in Mexico or with your Mexican friends, depending on what level you are, you're not Mexican, you're American. So you're neither here nor there, you're in the middle. And this middle that he talks about is bicultural. And 
Bicultural individuals, especially those with high levels of bicultural identity integration, may benefit from having developed wide behavioral repertoires of social skills and mastery of cognitive frame switching that allows them to handle diverse situations. Um, so um, that being said, because even though my sample, even though all of my sample have uh, experienced a form of discrimination, the fact that they didn't let that get in the way of achieving some of their goals, such as going into higher education, demonstrates that they know that there's two different cultures going on, but through time they have been able to adapt to both of them and therefore be bicultural. So in conclusion, my sample of Forest Grove High School graduates who are currently in college um, degrees towards assimilation in regards to language are more assimilated towards the Anglo-American culture. When it comes to culture, they're more assimilated towards the Hispanic culture. As far as discrimination goes, because they have a good balance between both of them, it's not, um, it's not, it doesn't affect them towards reaching their goals. And thus, that's, thus um, that is how they see their ethnic identity as being bicultural. Therefore, um, my sample of second generation and generation 1.5, Hispanic Americans have an equal balance between both of their cultures, thus making them bicultural. And I would like to give a special thanks to both my advisors, Adam Rosalovich and Nancy Kristoff, for helping me through the process, as well as my participants for letting me interview them, and my family, my mom, who unfortunately isn't here, she's in the hospital, and my dad, who's back there. Students who, who were in college, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, how much do you think you could generalize beyond that small group, uh, given sort of your own views based on informal empirical evidence? How much of these conclusions might carry over more broadly? I realize that's speculation. Um, well, like I said, I, well, I actually did also um, literature reviews, so mm -hmm. I had that in addition to my interviews. And what I noticed more is that people of, I didn't do, for, um, individuals of second generation specifically, they uh, they are they lean towards being more bicultural because it's still kind of it's still it's not so far away from the the roots I guess. Whereas there's more of a difference towards the third generation, and you can see a little bit more of that in how uh, in different ways. And so they're not as assimilated as the second. If 
you to list maybe one or two of the top barriers to assimilation, something that kind of is really obstructive. And one of the things I think about is teaching at Texas Tech, where in Lubbock, Texas, we have a very large Latino Latina population, like we do here in the Forest Grove area. I was really uh, astounded by the number of Hispanic students that I worked with who had to really push back against their own families to attend a four-year university. They really saw a four-year college degree as an Anglo thing, as a gringo thing, a white thing. And um, to me, it seems like that is a, um, a major obstruction. You got your, your you know, you have a, you have a, a family unit who, who are very alienated from our, you know, uh, Americanized understanding of education. Um, so maybe if you could just speak about it a little bit, what are some of these obstructions that you might think of, maybe based on yourself, maybe based upon what you know of, of the community, that tend to get in the way of um, Hispanic students getting a four-year college degree? Um, well, I think that um, um, I guess one of the things that I saw was that there's they have a they feel like there's a sense of obligation towards the family, and that helps or that um, that makes things a little bit harder, especially when one is in school. Uh, I had a, one student who mentioned that they were part of a part of like a club or something, and um, it was of Hispanics who were attending college, and they described that one student was having a lot of difficulties with being in college and helping his family because he had to he had to take care of his sisters and driving here and there as well as um, um, take care of his mom because her, she was a single mom first before this. And then um, also some of them didn't, their parents didn't understand that they're going to college because they want to get a better, better education. And so they felt like, oh, you're just wasting your time. Why, why aren't you just working right now? You've already graduated from high school. Um, going off what you said about the obligation, I noticed that you were talking about the senior center and you sort of just mentioned that, but you didn't really explain why they said that it wasn't an option. Could you give an explanation for that? Yeah, um, again, like I said, there's a strong emphasis on family and so they didn't want to send their students, or they didn't want to send their parents to the senior center because um, their parents have sacrificed so much for them that it was a way to give back. And had one student who mentioned that they had already promised their mom that they would change her diapers when she gets old because uh, that's what they did to her. And so it was a way to get back. Um, did you expect the results to be reversed? Like, did you expect most of them to be more like, assimilated to the Mexican American part of the culture? Or did you expect them to be more American? Yeah, I had, I had well, I guess I didn't have any, no idea. I had a little bit of idea, but um, I wasn't exactly sure where it would go. Like originally, before I had done any research, um, I was just looking at myself, and I didn't really know where I fit in, so to say. But um, I just, I kind of had a, an assumption that they would lean towards being more Americanized. I have one last question. Yeah. Because you said that you know, there seems to be a little bit of tension at the end of your presentation today about whether it's good or what bicultural means. Because at one point it sounded like bicultural, being bicultural is actually the never fitting in no matter where you are. Your quote was the, you know, the person who went to Mexico and was, you know, pocho or, you know, not uh, Mexican enough, but then here in the United States, not American enough. And you said that they're bicultural. And, but later on, so that seemed negative. And then, but in your conclusion, it's what you're saying, these people actually are able to move between these two worlds and this is a positive thing. So what what do you think it really is? What are you trying to say with this? Um, I think it's generally a positive thing. I was describing that quote because that's um, that was more of the moment when that individual felt that crisis, so that was when they first were noticed it. And so at that moment it kind of felt like a struggle and they didn't know what to do type of thing. Whereas now, um, through time they've been able to understand this a little bit better. Actually, out of time, so if we can get one more.